We are back on the Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. DJ getting up close and personal with everybody, making sure you are watching. Are you tuned in? Yes, sir. Let's go. That's DJ Shockley. That's Dave Archer. Dave, have you gotten some rest? Are you? It did. You yeah. did. Okay. Yeah, good. Sure did. Sure good. did. Yeah. No, no, no. I think the bigger we're, question we're day removed. and the better question is: Okay, bring it. Did the selfie work better this time? <laughs> <laughs> I got approval from my daughter that the selfie. I went back to the actual same spot same I spot. did back in 2014. I think my feet were still planted in the same spot. <laughs> Took the picture. <laughs> this time the head was up. There was a smile on the face. It wasn't. I didn't. It have, wasn't. You didn't push the. I didn't have six in. chins working <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. So, right, so the the side story is yeah. Dave got uh, <laughs> Dave got dressed down by his daughter yeah. when he I tried did. to send her a selfie with um, the uh, the bridge in the background. And um, really, did she was not very happy with it, right? No, she she was down. She said it was one of the worst selfies ever taken. <laughs> so, so, so DJ she wanted mix, to know if Arch took a new words. selfie. With, Rack, big, Rack. with Big Ben in the background, we got it taken care of. Rack, yeah. we both have daughters. I mean, has your daughter ever told you that picture was terrible? Oh, my gosh, yeah. Especially when you get one that's a teenage year. Oh, yeah. She's the coolest thing in the world now. My right? daughter. Like, my, there's no cool factor yeah. with us. Yeah. We played in the NFL, but we yeah. have zero cool factor, right? My my daughter has me conscious of FaceTime now because uh, <laughs> a couple of times I've been on with her, she just starts laughing because she's like, Daddy, why are you so close to the phone? Why are you so close to it? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay. So now every time I'm on FaceTime, I'm like this now. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, were you, we, all, we, all uh, learned. we all learned. Were you all sure. close to your television or your radio dial uh, yeah. for the Falcons game uh, against the Jaguars in London this weekend because we're going to go back and revisit. We'll break it down. We will talk about the Falcons' losses, and then we will – Kind of fast forward the keys to redemption as uh, Atlanta hosts the Houston Texans coming into town, which if you would have said two weeks ago, oh, this looks like a favorable matchup. And then now C.J. Stroud has had other plans the last Man. couple of weeks with those Houston Texans, so we'll get into that. So let's start with uh, breaking down this matchup against the Jaguars over in London at Wembley Stadium. Uh, Arch, you were there. DJ, you were not there, right? I, I was I not. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. No, mate. Shock was coaching the quarterback at Auburn. That's this right. That's yeah, right. Shock was in, yeah. no was doubt. in the planes. No doubt. Uh, trying to get my dolls. UGA dub. got a dub against the Auburn Tigers. Dave, let's get a uh, let's get a spotlight on a player that you felt like, even coming from a loss, had a pretty solid or promising performance. Yeah, it's a guy I've leaned on before. I'm going to, again, leave some of the low-hanging fruit for Shock because I know he's going to go not, a certain I may not way. take no, it. No, you're not going to take I'm, it? I'm going to reach pick, for the Pick that apple? Reaching for the top. Um, I thought Nate Landman continues to impress at the linebacker spot. I brought him up, I think, oh, last week or two yeah. weeks ago. Uh, Landman had, th I think, 13 tackles in the game. He was he was all over the place. I thought he had a couple of bone-crunching bone hits. Um, that he that he brought to the table, but I, th I think his understanding of what they're trying to do defensively, he fits what Ryan Nielsen wants. He wants aggressive linebackers that are coming downhill and bringing the mail, and he's doing that kind of stuff. I thought he did a really good job of fitting the run. Um, they they got sideways a couple times, and there's some things to fix defensively, right, Shock? I mean, no you're all, you're all gonna when you go back and look at the tape. There's a lot of things to fix. Certainly, some stuff on offense. There'll be some things to fix on defense. Um, and I think those, some of that will be run fits and some of that will be, you know, guarding zone read or whatever it might be. But um, I thought Landman uh, stepped up again big time at linebacker. Yeah, Troy Anderson not in the lineup anymore due to injury. So you, it's next man up philosophy in the NFL. And then in the hope from a coaching staff, a fan perspective, even former players, is that next man up seizes the opportunity. And so far, Landman taking care of business. DJ, who you got? I'm going to stay on that defensive side of the ball, too, and talk about a guy. And I think. I'm not saying he's going to turn into one of these guys or become a uh, Ed Reed or become a Paula Malu, but I'm just talking about on just the impact he has on a game, the impact he has on a defense, and Jesse Bates has become, I think, yeah. that for this defense. I mean, yeah. you watch some of the stuff that he's doing in these first four games. You talk about this last game, you know, had a tackle for loss, had a forced fumble. Uh, the communication that he has within a ball game, uh, there was a particular play, Archie probably remember, they go from – uh, a really condensed set, and then and boom, Jacksonville goes to five wide, and all you see is Jesse Bates, you know, yelling at Richie Grant, and you see guys moving, you see him communicating. He go back to the high now, Richie Grant. Come, I mean, just so much stuff goes on within a defense, and the way he's playing every single week, he has shown the ability to better get this defense into you know prime spots and make plays too. I mean, um, the, the play to force a fumble was you know so spot on. And understanding, you know, where the ball is and all that. So he is a guy that each and every week 
you know, teams got to come in where you say, all right, I got a plan for a defensive end. I got a plan for a pass rusher. Well, a lot of people come in and say, I got to know where number three's at because this guy is a ball hawk for one, and he's making plays on the ball, and he's going from high hole to, you know, down in the box. So he's a little bit of everywhere, and it's hard to account for that guy. Yeah, his leadership is immeasurable too, yeah. right, guys? I mean, uh, even on the play where – they gave up the touchdown where you, you missed the sack. Richie Grant's got him lined up perfectly to get the sack. Good move by Trevor Lawrence to make him miss in the backfield. You'd like to get the sack. You don't. He gets out of the pocket, and then you, you kind of screw coverage up a little bit, and, and Ridley gets in behind A.J. for the touchdown. First thing Jesse came over was put his arm around A.J. and started talking to A.J., about some of the things that were going on there, what, what the call was, where there was maybe a screw up or something, but con continuing to nurture guys and, and bring guys along. I saw him do it. I told you last week about, yep. with Jeff Akuda on mm -hmm. the bus going to the going to the, going to the airport after the Detroit game. So love the leadership to add into what what Shock's talking about the immeasurable stuff he does on the field just as a player. You know, and I'll piggyback off that arch because there's two things. Number one, it can be real easy to be upset, right? And just want to, you know, throw your head up in the air and start cursing and saying, "How do we give up a touchdown?" But from that moment to go right to his teammate and to get everybody on the same page, talk about maybe what he saw, what what was missed, the communication or whatever, number one. Number two, AJ Terrell's not a rookie, yeah. okay? And it just shows that it doesn't care. It doesn't matter for mm -hmm. him. Like, Jesse Bates might do the same thing with Calais Campbell. That's the type of person he is, the type of leader. And I think it's safe to say that Atlanta did their homework and found one of the best safeties in the game and, and glad to, to see that he's on the Atlanta defense. I'm just going to highlight one guy. I'm not going to get B. John Robinson because it seems like we talk about him every week and everybody knows how special he is, and he continues to go out there and perform. But I'm going to talk about Jonu Smith. I mean, he was another player that was brought over to this team in the offseason. A playmaker, a big body, a tight end. Obviously, Arthur Smith fits what he likes to do offensively. Thinking about the season, I think a lot of us were thinking, you know, a chance to be a breakout year for Kyle Pitts, right? You get mm. some more weapons around him, and this guy is number four overall pick, has a chance to really be a difference maker moving forward, and you just never know who it's going to be. And right now, it's John U. Smith is the one that's leading the team in receiving yards this year. He has his career high this past weekend with 95 yards, six receptions in the game, and he's kind of become maybe that little bit of a security blanket for Desmond Ritter in the passing game. Never really know who it's going to be, but I think is another guy that's finding he's got a role on this offense and he's continuing to produce. And the degree of toughness he's bringing to the table too. He's catching the ball in between the hash yes. marks, in between the numbers. He's getting banged around a little bit. And he's also a part of the run game. When he's – he more often than not, he – and Michael Pruitt are the two guys that are in blocking. Yes. You know, and he's done a good job. Kyle's done a good job blocking as well, but certainly Johnny was bringing a little bit, a degree of physicality to the game as well. Great. So that's kind of a spotlighting some guys that we did feel like had positive performances. But at the end of the day, when you come away with a loss, there are just like the coaching staff, just like the players, you got to come in and, and what, what I would say is face the music, right? Mm. This is, that's kind of the, the, the ebbs and flows, the the emotional roller coaster, if you will, of playing in the NFL is sometimes you come in and you get to celebrate, you get victory Mondays. They they talk about how great things were in the film room, but then there's sometimes when you when you come in and it's difficult, right? And we've all been through it. We've all been through those film sessions where it gets heated. It's you know you made the mistake, but then you actually got to see it on tape, and it's just like, oh my gosh, that didn't look that bad. DJ, I'm going to come to you. Where do you feel like things went wrong in the Jacksonville game? You know, I, I think it's it's a couple errors that uh, we've talked about the last few weeks. And, you know, uh, I think you can point to a, a number of things. Obviously, turnovers are a big part of it. That's the one thing that you, you just can't have. Um, sacks are a big part of it. But I think the other thing is third down again. I mean, you were 10 of 26 the last two ball games on third down. And when you look at starting a game, again, starting it slow and not being able to have the success you want, in the run game or the pass game, it leaves you to feel kind of a, 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 a mode of where do we go from here? And it's hard to look at the certain situations of a game and say, all right, there are certain factors that, uh, that take away from the certain things that happen. But I think the biggest thing is not being able to, to, to create longer yardage plays or create longer yardage plays in when, when you're running the football or when you're throwing. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things I, I've looked at the last two ball games and said, why have we struggled so much on third down? And last week, Arch had a great, great stat about the amount of yards you get on first down, like one point, whatever it was, and that's a big deal. And for me, I think that's where 
we have struggled on the offensive side of the ball a lot is being able to have that success in early downs. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it fused into, you know, third down, which we have not been able to be good at. And obviously move the change, which you want to keep your offense on the field and have other guys be a factor. But until you have the early down success, until you start the game a little bit faster, I think the same things are going to continue to happen. Yeah, shock's dead on. Uh, for, I tracked it in the first half this week, 2.5 yards of play on first down. Yep. Yeah. Last week it was 1.8 yards. Yep. So. Yep. He improved, but it wasn't improvement enough. And, and so you get stagnant on offense. makes it hard for a play caller because now you got to come up with perfect calls to get third and long situations converted. Um, so, yeah, that shock is completely dead right. I mean, you got to have early down success. I think, you know, kind of what came to my mind is a combination or a continuation of what you guys talked about. But if my calculations are right, and I, I know it's only four games, but Atlanta scored three points in the first quarter this mm. year. Three yeah. points in the first quarter. Now, here's what I do know in being realistic, because this comes from a guy that calls college football games on the weekend, but I know how the NFL works, okay? In college, yes, your first four games of the season, you might be outscoring people 56 to 10 in the first quarter. That's not the case in the NFL. So I'm not thinking that that's going to be what it is. Right. But when you've only scored three points in the first quarter through four games, what that tells me is you're not having early down success. You're not necessarily con con converting on third down. You're not punching the ball in on the red zone and potentially turnovers. So all of those things end up kind of working together. And when you are not scoring points in the third quarter, guess what you are doing, fellas? You are playing catch up. Yeah. And playing catch up in the National Football League is a difficult proposition we, because you become one dimensional. And right now, Arch, this is not a great position to be in for Atlanta when you become one dimensional and you feel like you got to throw the football. And that's where Atlanta is kind of struggling right now with the with the pass protection consistency and getting the ball down the field. Well, the thing that the bonus on that is you only given up 10 points in the first quarter. <laughs> so, I mean, the defense yeah. is holding on the rope. So you're not very far behind as it turns out. Now, you got down 17 nothing in this game, and it, it felt like it was going to get nasty, and the defense came in and got a stop on that second interception, and so you held the game in perspective. You go down and score, and now all of a sudden it's a ball game again. But from a – I don't see one-dimensional being called in the game, mm -hmm. okay? So I hear what you're saying, but that's not the way Arthur Smith's calling the game. There are shot plays being put in the game. There are screen plays. There's perimeter type stretching type plays, horizontal stretches, and as well as vertical stretches. He's doing a number of these things. You have to execute on offense. Yep. That means you have to block them. You have to catch it. You have to throw it to the right people. Yep. You know, and you got to throw it to guys that are open that are there for you. He's providing some opportunities there. So it's going to be about players, and it's not just one player. It's not just the quarterback. It's not from an offensive standpoint. And shock. I mean. Help me with this. I mean, you talk about execute. You can have everybody do everything wrong on defense, but one guy makes the play yep. and he makes the tackle. Yep. That rarely ever happens on offense. Now, yep. B. John Robinson did a little deal on Muma, the <laughs> linebacker. That was an individual move, <laughs> and he made him look really bad, and he's still picking up some of his laundry after that move. But on offense, it takes everybody doing their job. If one guy breaks down, it blows the whole play up. Yeah. And it's not just one player. So that's where this week's going to be a really important week, Shock, for, for this offensive unit to come together as players as well as coaches to say, hey, let's, let's intensify the urgency on every down, not just one particular down or a certain part of the game. And I think you're spot on when you say that because I think you have to go back to the basics of – what makes a play or player successful. And I think it's the details. And we look at a ball game and we look at so many different things as former players of what you want to see, what happens within a play. And they're the small, minute things that make a play successful. You talk about each guy having to do their job. And a lot of people forget about, hey, if you have a, a, a run play and a guy breaks a big run, some you know you say, oh, the offensive line created a big hole. But then there's also the receivers down the field that have come down and cracked the safety so you can bounce it and, hey, you got one-on-one -on -one with the corner on the outside. There's so many things that happens. Or you got a guard in the center trying to get a combo up to the backer and maybe the guard doesn't get off and now that, 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 that linebacker makes a play. There's so many things that matters inside a play that affords the offense to have a successful one. I think ultimately that's kind of been – kind of the downfall here in the last couple of weeks is there have been a couple things here or there 
that have thrown off the execution that Arch just talked about for a particular play or for a particular series. Or if you get behind the chains, you get a a false start, you get a hole, you get something that puts you behind the chains. Now that changed the whole dynamic for the play caller. So there's so many things that goes in a play, and it's not just one particular person. And everybody looks at, you know, the quarterback or say, hey, he has to do this, he has to do that. Well, there's sometimes where, hey, maybe the receiver didn't come out his break fast enough. And you don't ever see that. As a fan, you may not even know that. Maybe you didn't get to the proper depth. Maybe, you know, this 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 guy just did a great job of breaking on the football. I mean, it, there's so many things that goes into it. So I think Arch is spot on with the fact of it's not just one guy when you look at this offense. There's not one guy you look at this defense. All these guys have to work together. And as players, we've always said this, you got to do your 1-11. Yeah. And I think that's what it comes down to. And when you go back to the basic of the details of technique and the things that you did on day one, that's ultimately what's going to make you successful as you go forward climbing out of, you know, maybe a little slump that you're in. You guys, you were talking about the fans are looking at it and they may not see some of those little nuances, but the average fan, what they always do is they point at the quarterback. Mm -hmm. And you guys know that life, right? And that's kind of what you sign up for playing that position. You're going to make the most money. You're going to get the most um, attention, but you're also going to get the most scrutiny. And and I don't think Desmond Ritter has – any shame in that? He has accepted responsibility. He continues to say that he needs to play better. But to your guys' points, everybody else needs to play better as well. In the moment watching the game, much like the, the average fan, I get frustrated. But then you take a step back, guys, and you think, okay, well, we can't take a step back, I understand. But you say pick six for a touchdown and a miscommunication in the secondary for a touchdown. Take those two plays away. You got yourself a football game. Yeah. Now, we can't take those plays away. Yeah. And that's what the coaches are going to say. We can't take them a play. They, they happen. We have to learn from you. You have to overcome it. Question for you guys, Arch, I'm going to come to you. Have you seen any common theme in the last two losses that continue to plague Atlanta? Well, one of the things you're seeing is you're beginning to see a little bit. This is a copycat league. And so teams are going to crowd the line of scrimmage. They're going to start. They're not. And we talked a little bit about this before we came on. You made the reference that that, that you know, stretching the field down the down the field. You got to touch people down the field with plays to to pull people open, to to stretch either horizontally or vertically to create a defense that can't crowd the box against the run game. I think it's a good point. Um, you also have to when you have opportunities to get guys the ball or guys have opportunity to make plays. Goes back to what Chuck and I were talking about. Have to execute that because if you miss on those, then all of a sudden the box gets tighter. Yep. And it gets tighter. You know, I've got to hit those shots. If I've got an option route to the outside, i got to put the ball on Bijan and get him, get him the football, get a first down. Now, all of a sudden, I'm worried about Bijan getting on the edge because, you know, I, I, I treated him as a one-on-one player. Now, all of a sudden, i got to have another guy over there. Maybe now that takes another guy out of the box. See, that's how it spreads the box out a little bit. So you got to hit on these plays. If, if, I've got, if they play zero coverage and they bring a blitz – and I'm the back back there, I need to step in the B-gap and take that extra blitzer. Mm-hmm. If I go the wrong direction and the guy blitzes through, my quarterback's on the ground. Yep. These are things that are happening in the game, and these are things that they're going to have to work through. Um, but I, I think that there's a common theme that they're starting to see that people are beginning to get tighten the box down. Now, as far as the defense goes, I think the defense is doing some good things and creating problems from protection standpoint. Coverage has been good. They've just got to find a way to get off the field in the second half. Mm-hmm. I thought that in the in the fourth quarter, as good as the defense played, and everybody say, well, the defense played well enough for you to win. Okay, well, maybe not because you didn't win the game. Mm-hmm. And some of that had to do with that they possessed the ball for nine minutes or ten minutes of the fourth quarter. Yeah. you got to be able to get off the field. So the game changes, the per- perspective of the game changes as minutes come off the clock and different situations present themselves. And you got to attack those moments. But um, I think the positive thing for me, real quickly, and I know I'm kind of skewing here and going all over the place for you, is the quarterback made two bad mistakes in the first quarter, mm-hmm. or first half, the two interceptions. Pick six, and the next play throws, he misreads or didn't really read it, threw it over the middle, assuming his guy would be open and picked off. Okay? He didn't go in a shell. He played the second half. He threw some rope shock in the second half. Big time throws, the throw to Drake for the touchdown, the throw to Johnny on the sideline. He threw two tight window throws over the middle to convert on third down yep. to move the ball. I mean, you're in position, he gets a zero blitz, he puts the ball on Drake in the back corner of the end zone. If we didn't have a guy come clean on him, 
He's going to be able to hit Drake for a touchdown. Yep. Drake makes the circus grab, didn't get both feet down. That's going to be another touchdown. All of a sudden, you look up, it's a one-score game. Yep. That's even with the, the mistakes. He, he did not go in a shell. He did not shy away from what was going on. That's impressive to me, and that's what Arthur was looking for. You get, guys are going to make mistakes in games. I love the fact you brought that up about Ritter and what he did in the second half because as former players, we've all been there. I mean, I think anybody can relate to this, not even just, you know, in the game of football, in life where you make a couple mistakes and things don't go your way and you don't go on a shell. You don't go home and say, all right, well, you know, I didn't turn in something right at, at work or whatever it may be, and now, you know, they're going to fire me. No, I, I love the fact that Arthur Smith, for one, said you're still our guy. You're going to go out and you're going to prove it. And I think that spoke volumes to his teammates. I think that spoke volumes – to people watching the game who understand it. Like, this guy had to overcome a lot. That's tough. Two straight passes where you throw an interception and you feel like you're laying down your team, but then you come back and you make plays to help your team. And I think that's that's crucial that you, you find out what he can do in those adverse situations because they're going to continue to happen. You came into the season saying, guess what? Desmond's our guy. We're going to ride with him. And I love the fact, I mean, I'm, I'm watching the game at home and, you know, you, you hear him talking about it and, you know, they're saying X, Y, and Z is going on. But the, you see him go out and execute on that first drive coming out. And mm. you talk about that possession, you know, you're down 26, you get that. Hey, it's 20 to 13. You're right in this ballgame with six minutes to go. Your defense get a stop. Hey, now all that is irrelevant. You go and make plays. So I love the fact that Desmond didn't allow that adverse situation kind of overshadow what he wanted to do in the second half, which shows you exactly what kind of player you have in Desmond Ritter. So for everybody who – you know, says, yeah, we got to do this or do that. Your quarterback showed up in the second half and gave you an opportunity. And obviously, you come up a little short, but I love the fact that uh, he's one of those guys. And Arthur Smith said, you know what? We're going to let him find his way out of this. And as QPs, yeah. we love that. No kids. It's going to happen. I, mean, I don't know. It's hard to turn it loose after you throw it <laughs> to the other team a couple of times, but he came out ripping it. But I do think that that's important. And, and so, all that being said, Hey, this is rosy. We're trying to paint a, ro a rosy picture about Desmond Ritter, and I think Ritter's got great potential and great ability. He's now got to take that. Mm -hmm. You know as well as I do, Shock. Hey, sure. you're only as good as your last outing, and it didn't go well for the team. So now he's got to take what he did in the second half, and that's got to be who he is in the first half yep. this week. Yeah, yeah. That's and right. that that's important, and, sure. and and he knows that. All right, so speaking of first half, let's move it forward to the next game of Atlanta. We'll be back home this weekend against the Texans. Dave, I'll come right back to you. Some things that you feel uh, – one or two things that you feel like has to be improved upon for Atlanta to have success against Houston this week. Well, the easy part is to talk about the slow start, and you've got to get off to a quicker start, so I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go to the other side of the football that I think all of us feel like defensively – you're playing pretty solid. Um, you've given up 13 points on the year in the fourth quarter. You've given up 10 points on the year in the first quarter on defense. You're doing a really good job of starting pretty fast defensively and closing games out mm -hmm. on this. The only part out there that's kind of left is the explosive. You can't give up explosive plays. You had the Ridley touchdown in the first quarter. That was the first touchdown they'd given up. Um, to in the first quarter, you you can't you can't allow that. This is a team in the Texans that come in. They have 29 plays of 15 yards or more in their first four games. 28 of the 29 are throwing the football. Mm -hmm. So this is a team that's going to try to light you up throwing the ball. C.J. Stroud has gotten in a good rhythm here the last couple of games. They lost their first two. They've won their last two. We won our first two. We've lost our last two. And so here come two or two teams. Mm -hmm. That from a perfect perspective standpoint, both fan bases are in completely different places, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. But you're two and two, and it's early in the season. You could easily write the ship here in the bends, so we need it to be loud. The interesting part here, Shock, is that they have the number two overall pick in C.J. Stroud that, as Arch mentioned, is hitting his stride. Um, over 1,200 yards passing already, so he's averaging over 300 yards a game. Goose egg, Threw too. for a career-high 384 a couple weeks ago against Indianapolis. Mm. And even though they've got a banged-up offensive line, they have not given up a sack the last two weeks. And they mentioned they played against Pittsburgh last week. Pittsburgh got a couple of dudes that can get after the passer. No doubt. So what kind of animal are they facing with the Texans this week? I mean, I think you painted a picture of one – Arch mentioned the fan base coming in, and you mentioned the outlook of what this offense looks like for the Houston 
and the things they're doing well, it paints a picture of a team that's coming in that's confident. You yeah. got a quarterback that's confident. Yeah. And the one thing that can give you some hope is the fact you've been able to create chaos for a quarterback the last couple of games. And the Falcons did that. I mean, you, you saw David on Yamada have a sack and a half in his ball game. You saw Grady collapse in his pocket. You saw Bud Dupree. And you're doing this with four. And that's something that we haven't seen in a long time around here is creating chaos with four, getting after the passer. And this is a game where if you allow a guy who's coming in already with confidence to sit in the pocket and give him a couple hitches and find a guy, he's going to find a guy. Yeah. And you mentioned he's coming in. He's got zero interceptions on the season, too. That tells you – this guy's not just throwing it to anybody. Yep. And you mentioned not getting any sacks. I mean, for a quarterback, that's 7 on 7 for us because if you're not getting any pressure on him and I got a chance to survey the field, I'm going to have success. And we're in the National Football League. These guys are good enough to do that, and C.J. Stroud has been that kind of guy. So I think ultimately it comes down to being able to show something different that he hasn't probably seen. And we saw it in game one, what they did to Bryce Young as far as you know creating some havoc for him on the back end and also getting pressure on him. Uh, this is, will be a similar, I think, game plan. And the Falcons have done that. I mean, I look back at some of the game, and Ryan Nielsen does such a good job of creating the matches up front for those guys to win. He simply creates one-on-ones for the defensive line to be able to have that pressure, and he did it last ball game. I mean, the, the pressure uh, the sack Bud Dupree had, he had three guys to the right side of the offense, the left side of the offensive line, so you force a one-on-one with that side and force those guys to win. So – Anya Mata, Grady, Bud Dupree, one of those guys are going to win, yeah. as we know. And I love the fact that Ryan Nielsen is finding creative ways to do that. And I think this is a similar ball game where you try to create that pressure on him to give him something different to look at. And then, obviously, on the back end, you got seven guys back there uh, going against, you know, four or five receivers. Hopefully, you can lock it down. Yeah, we, uh, we talked about the successes for Desmond Ritter as a starter at home versus on the road. So, you know, maybe – like Arch said, he is able to kind of channel some of his performance from post interceptions last week, being back at home uh, and then feeding off of the defense. Hopefully we see a good bit of that pressure that you talked about DJ getting after CJ Stroud. Cause anybody saw him at Ohio state, he made a living of carving up defenses and he's kind of starting off his career in the NFL in the same capacity. La- last time he was in the bins, he carved up my dog. So. <laughs> It seems like you got a little personal memory <laughs> yeah. of that one. Huh? Remember that, man. That was cool. uh, before we go, real quick, uh, NFL debuted their Toy Story version of the Falcons uh, Jaguars game on Disney Plus. That's how Did Arch you guys get game. to see yeah. any of it, and what were your thoughts of it? Wasn't it, wasn't that in your monitor when you was calling the game? Yeah, that's exactly that how I watched the game. Those are my replays. <laughs> my replays. I, I thought that was cool. They had Slink as the uh, as the first down. Oh yeah, they, they oh, stretched yeah. him out for the yeah. first down. No, I didn't see. I didn't see much of it. I did get some highlights sent to me by my family and some other people that were watching it. Um, I think the the couple comments that I heard was all the players' heads were too big, <laughs> uh, and and there was one glitch. I don't know if you noticed it, but there was a glitch in the play. Calvin Ridley's touchdown don't count. Yeah, he dropped it. Yeah. So we the replay Disney, shows he, he did not catch the ball. I don't know why they didn't go to that replay. But evidently there was a glitch on it. But I would have used that replay on the Ridley touchdown as opposed to the actual one. But uh, no, it's pretty cool the way they can they can do the whatever it is the CGI, the animation, all that kind of stuff. Just pretty neat. And that's what I'll say too, man. I I didn't get a chance to see a lot of it either. I saw snippets like everybody else. But uh, you're talking about just bringing more eyes to the wonderful game that we already love, yeah. and we know it's a game that everybody watches. It gets the most numbers. It's I remember when you come into the league, the first thing they tell you is, hey. This is the biggest entity in the world, the NFL, and now we're bringing more eyes to it. I, I, I saw tons of videos of literally little kids sitting in front of the TV watching it in Andy's room, you know, obviously. So uh, it's, it's fun to have a different variation of it to try to bring more attention to the game, which we all love. And yeah. now you got, you know, four or five-year-old kids, you know, you know, watching the game with the big old heads and all. The amount of creativity that's involved uh, around this game is, is pretty impressive. Um, and for a few former players here, it's pretty awesome to see how the NFL continues to grow this game and reach different audiences. Not to say that kids aren't excited in the regular version of a football game, but if you get something maybe that kind of appeals to them a little bit right. more, that's more <laughs> eyeballs that are watching the game and kind of growing up with it as well. So uh, kudos to the NFL and Disney Plus on that uh, new experience, and we'll look forward to see how they continue to expand that creativity. 
Uh, Falcons back at home this weekend against the Houston Texans. C.J. Stroud and company coming in with some confidence. We talked about it, and I don't want to just all talk about all offense. D'Amico Ryan's their head coach, and he was a really good linebacker in this league, and they're going to come in prepared to play some defense too uh, because that's one thing you know from a defensive-minded head coach that he is not going to let his team get ran over on that side of the ball. So Atlanta's going to have to come in. Uh, flush whatever they had last week, learn from it, and be ready to play another game in the NFL because there is no such thing no as a walkover game move on, in the baby. National Football League. On behalf of DJ Shockley, Dave Archer, I'm Derek Rackley. This has been the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. We'll be back with you. Same time, same place. I know it's a podcast. There's not a time and a place. But we'll be back with you next week right here. Falcons Audible.